you can start it. All right. Well, welcome to Leadership with Vision. Pastor Austin Gardner and Jeff Bush, and uh, thankful to be here. Uh, we're going to continue on our study of what we started earlier, um, just a while ago. And so this will be a starting up uh, uh, missionary training ideas number two. And so let me start the podcast. And if you want to, if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to get involved in the conversation, we invite you to. Well, I'd like to welcome you to Leadership with Vision. This is Austin Gardner, and I'm here with Jeff Bush, Director of Vision Baptist Missions. And we're on podcast number two, Missionary Training Ideas. And we thank you so very much for watching. Please share this right now. Those of you watching on Facebook, share it with your friends. Invite others to come, and let's get in a conversation. We're going to be talking about uh, how you get trained after you're already a missionary and after you've already raised your support and after you're already actually on the field. So head, head away there, Brother Jeff. All right. So uh, just a recap real quick. We talked about several different, um, you know, as Pastor said, you finished deputation, you're over there. Uh, why do you need to work under a missionary? What's the important things? What you should, what you should be learning? So we covered several of those. So we're going to go a little bit different direction, still talking about a guy who gets to the field. So the very first question, what does the first year on the field look like for the husband and what should it look like for the wife? Well, I think the very first, you know, the first thing you're going to do, and I'd like to, we'll continue this and there'll be quite a few things. Uh, the first thing is you got to get your house set up and you're going to take anywhere from two weeks to six weeks to get set up, depending on the country and how hard it could take longer than that even. So getting a house and getting set up can be a pretty tough move. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the the director of the mission I served with used to have a good saying. I thought he said, "Hang the last last picture before you start doing other things. Get your wife comfortable so you can stay." But after you get through that that first part and you're set up and you bought your furniture, you got your vehicles uh, or vehicle and you've got your house set up. Then you need to be in language school. And language school ought to be five days a week, at least four hours a day. The man ought to be, the man ought to be uh, te studying the language many hours after language school. The first part of language school is the structured part. But you can't learn the language without getting out among the people. And uh, you have to be out with the people. You have to be where you, you know, uh, the Brewsters, who wrote the language acquisition made practical book said swimming is best learned wet. And that means you got to jump in the water and you got, that's how you learn how to swim. You can't read about it. You can't study about it. You can't see it in a book. You've got to get out there with the people and, and do that. So I'm going to tell you that a minimum for the man, a minimum of 40 to 60 hours a week in language. And that can count church. That can count every church meeting you're going to. Uh, don't do so much homework unless it's a learning character thing. Be with people. Language is social, not academic. Language is social, not academic. Language is attitude, not aptitude. It's not how smart you are. It's what attitude you have. Do you love the people and do you want to spend time with them? My wife could go home after language school. We often, we have usually ate lunch somewhere because our kids were in a, in a school you had somebody at home watching David, who was a baby at the time, our son David. And so uh, we would, after language school, we would go get a bite to eat, a sandwich or a, or even a, a go to a nice restaurant. And then we would go home and my wife would stay there and I would find different uh, Mexicans that I could spend time with. One in particular who became the most wonderful friend you could possibly imagine. He taught me uh, everything that I know about culture and language. Uh, I just got my start in language school. You go to all the church services. You get involved in everything happening. You don't say, well, that's my day off. You learn to adjust your schedule. You'll soon be the leader. And so right now, follow that other guy. Okay, so there's a couple of questions under this. Let me tell you the friends that are watching. If you have a question, um, I've got some of them listed down here that were asked. Uh, please just jump in. Feel free before we change um, directions. Here's one of them. So we're talking about this when you first get there. Um, maybe what does it look like for the husband? What does it look like for the wife? This is what somebody asked. Um, we're used to, my wife and I are used to being together on deputation. Will it be hard um, not being together when we're on the field or should we still do everything together? Well, I don't think real life is like deputation. 
I think, uh, so, uh, you know, in real world, you go off to your work, she takes care of the children, she stays home or, or even has a job. So I'm going to tell you that uh, you, I wouldn't go to language school together if I could help it. I wouldn't want to be in the same class with my wife. Uh, Betty and I took some classes together because that's where the language school was organized. You had one class that you did together with the, the lady who was in charge of everything. <clears throat> and that was embarrassing to my wife. Uh, and and uh, I didn't get embarrassed because I'm just a clown and a buffoon. But uh, my, my wife... Uh, would get embarrassed, and if you're in a if you're in a you have a competitive spirit, often your wife will have a better accent. She may pick up the language quicker, and when you're studying with the same teacher, you could very easily get offended. You could very easily get competitive. You could very easily develop some bitterness. So I wouldn't want to go to language school with her anymore. Than I had to see her on the breaks, and then I would after that take her and go somewhere with her. Then after that, I'd go spend time with nationals. And then I'm going to be at home at night. I'm going to have time with my wife. I'm going to have a, some, a family day. I'm going to do all sorts of things like I should do in the ministry. But yeah, you need to be separated. My wife's not here right now, and I probably won't see her again until supper time today. So this one you pretty much already answered, but somebody asked, after language school in the morning, should we be separate or do things together? You answered that, so let me jump to the next let one. Let me just say this about being together. If you're together, one of you will cover for the other one. Yeah, how about that? So my wife would have easily let me do all the talking. Now, in English, my wife does all the talking. But in Spanish, my wife would have easily said, hey, tell them this. Hey, do this. Hey, ask this. And so I would suggest that you not be together. She needs, maybe there's a helper at home taking care of the kid, uh, uh, somebody helping you at the housework, and your wife could go talk to her, or maybe she can find a lady in the ministry, but she needs her own practice away from you. Okay, here's a question that we got. Um, is it a good idea to let your wife make phone calls on deputation, even if she wants to? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, not a discussion about that. But I will say to you, I will say to you, if a, if a wife called me for a husband, I would, um, I don't think that would interest I don't me. know that most pastors would. I think most pastors are going to be like, uh, why is your wife calling me and why aren't you calling? And uh, so... I know I, I know of one fellow that's even tried to hire it out and get other people to do it. At one time, we tried to get uh, students to, to make a phone calls. Never worked. It's hard for them to tell. Uh, it's not even hard for them to tell you no, but it's definitely hard for them to tell a surrogate to, no, to tell another person no for you. So you call up and say, hello, uh, I'm calling for missionary so-and-so, and I'd like to see about getting him a meeting. It's very easy for them to say uh, no and uh the, all they need is a, an easy way out. So I wouldn't give them that way out personally. I mean, it would be nice if my wife would do the calling and wild. she could do the driving. And, <laughs> and if she could do the preaching. And, yeah. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Okay, here's the next one. Um, after the main hours of language class um, ends around noon, what should the husband spend the rest of the day doing? I suggest that you find a mentor. You find a uh, uh, in, in ham radio, which I was in a long time ago, they have an Elmer, a guy who's been in it a lot longer than you that can help you. And so I would find somebody, you got to ask the Lord for somebody that you can talk to. So this one man, he just took me under his wing. I actually went to his store and, uh, I worked in his store. I, I sat there all day long and we would go over what I was going over in language I actually sewed up soccer balls with him. So I would either, I, uh, I took another guy, his name was uh, Alfonso, and I asked him, he could speak some English, and I said, would you go visiting with me? And we'll knock on doors. And that's before I'd got to the other fellow. And so anytime he had a chance, we'd go and he'd talk. And then I'd say, teach me what to say at the next door. And he'd say, well, you can say good morning. And then that's enough for you. And so we'd go to the next door and I'd say good morning. And then we'd go to the next door and I'd say, can I say one more thing? And he'd say, well, say to them, uh, this is a gift. And so I would go, good morning. This is a gift. And so we went and, and we knocked on doors and that was, uh, that was fun. That was good. But I would say to you, find somebody who will spend time with you and help you. You can actually play and learn the language. You can go play soccer with them. You can go play a racquetball with them because in all the breaks, you're going to be talking Spanish, get out of the English world and into their world. Okay, so someone says, what if I need to do homework or study? Should I go home? Um, should I go to the church? Should I go somewhere else? Uh, and if so, why? I would suggest that you not go home. 
I find home to be a trap of a place. I find home to be where I want to relax. I find home to be the place where I can uh, let down my guard and uh, be lazy. Uh, I mean, that's what home is. Uh, that's why uh, people like you to work uh, where they can see you working. Uh, this morning, uh, Pastor Bobby Robertson died, uh, died and I, I was supposed to be here to make podcasts. And I got up and I was up early, and then, but I started watching videos about Pastor Bobby Robertson. And uh, then I told my wife, I said, if I don't hurry up, Jeff Bush is going to kill me because I was supposed to be making podcasts this morning. And so I came and I didn't even get here before I got a, uh, I got a text saying, are you coming or do I come to you? And so the whole point is I need that accountability. I need somebody to get me here and to get me in, in, in the thing so I wouldn't go home. Uh, if I did go home, I'd take somebody with me. I'd, t I'd invite a family over that didn't speak English. I would want somehow to be forced to speak the language. So Robert Canfield says, like the beard, Jeffrey, you need to keep it. It's easier to listen to podcasts when you have the beard. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Robert, I hate to tell you this, but you can't see a beard on a podcast. You might can on a, uh, on a Facebook Live. But anyway. Um, I would say along those same lines, um, you know, many times uh, when a missionary, whether on deputation on the field, uh, when he uses um, home as his place to work, whether it's to study, whether it's to make phone calls or, you know, whatever it is, uh, many times um, he has a lot of maybe family problems. And the reason is because we say, um, I was home all day yesterday studying, but at the same time, your wife was saying, sweetie, while you're here, why don't you help me out? And then um, then you guys get in an argument and you say, well, I was with you all day yesterday. She said, no, you weren't because you were with your computer. And you go back and forth. And you take a nap and you might check out the news and you check out Facebook and you find every way to waste time possible. And, you know, in this, we live in the most social generation ever, but you're social without ever being around people. And the only way to learn a language is to be around people. So divide your time. When it's time to work, work. When it's time to go home, go home. But you should not use home as an excuse for calling that work. Even though we are blessed to be in the ministry that you have more flexibility maybe than another guy, uh, you need to be very careful and make sure you work your hours. Pastor says very clearly, a missionary, um, a guy in ministry, if you don't work your 40 hours, hey man, you're not worth your salt. And so uh, don't be lazy. Don't use your um, your home as an excuse or, or whatever. Here's another question that comes. Um, I didn't see the comments from Robert. What does that say? Robert, Robert said uh, <laughs> that he can hear the manliness in your voice <laughs> because of your beard. You know, so I'm, I'm feeling disagrees. it. I'm feeling it. <laughs> but his wife will soon make him shave. Yeah, ah! I usually goes for yeah about five, six days, and she says, that's good, dear. <laughs> uh, yeah, my wife says, you can have a beard if you want to. I'm just not going to <laughs> so um, we've got Jonathan Anderson in Mexico says, my wife always says, if I'm working, I should leave the house. And when I'm done, come home and be home. <laughs> I agree with that. I think that's a, I think your wife is a genius. I think when we're home, we need to come home and be home because otherwise we just waste all of our time and we're not really, we're not there. And so our kids don't have a parent and, and our wife doesn't have a husband. So Miguel Sanabria says, uh, what would you tell a missionary that is about to leave for the field, things to do before leaving, preparations for when coming back for furlough, any advice is helpful, how to help the wife for, uh, to prepare for the switch or what? Well, I wouldn't even worry about coming back. I mean, that would just be the furthest thing from my mind right now. I would just be thinking about getting to the field and getting set up. So I'd get my setup fund. I'd make sure it was well-funded. I'd make sure I had full support. Don't play the game of trying to go under-supported. I think I'd go ahead and find a place, um, and, uh, one of those uh, rental places that you could, you know, fully furnished rental place overseas that you could have for four weeks to six weeks or eight weeks while you look for a house, unless the missionary has a way he's going to help you take care of that. Uh, I think that I would make sure if all my paperwork was up to date. You know, uh, most of the time when you go to the field, of course, Miguel, you're a national, you don't have this problem, but for a regular person, and you're not regular in other words, but for a regular person, you know, you need your birth certificates notarized, and then even uh, sometimes you need them with a certain seal 
that the government requires that's above a notary that's done in the, their embassy, birth certificate, marriage certificate, uh, a college degree, ordination papers, uh, all of that. Sometimes you need a letter guaranteeing you financially, so you need to get all of that. Find out from a veteran ministry all you need and get all of that ready because you're going to want to get paperwork to become, uh, you know, to, to get your visa. If you're going to a, a, a closed country or a, uh, 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 what, do, what do we call that, a creative access country, there'll be a whole different set of rules. So you want, but you do want to figure out, you don't want to figure out what you got to do to, to be ready to meet all the government requirements when you land. Okay, so the next question uh, would come, how much ministry should I be involved in? So you just arrive to the field. Um, if I can't speak the language at the start, how can I serve? What are some of the ideas that I should be doing? Well, you can be there. Uh, the very first thing you ought to do is you ought to make up your mind that, you know, I, I, heard, a, I heard a fellow say this week uh, on a podcast, he said, I made some big decisions a long time ago that don't uh, that help me not have to make small decisions. He said, I decided a long time ago I wouldn't miss church. He said, so I never had that question. So I never had that question. So on the mission field, why would you miss church? He said, well, I don't understand anything. It doesn't matter. You're there to learn, so go to church. Now, while I was in language school, there were people that would actually take a, uh, a, a novel and stick it in their Bible, and the whole time they were in church, they just read this novel. I would never do that. You go to church, and you write down every word that you understand that's being said. And I would say to you, uh, uh, what, what ministry can you be involved in? You can go to prayer meeting and just sit there on your knees, or maybe they'll let you pray in English, or maybe you can memorize a prayer. If you were coming to my country, I would teach you a 10 or 15 word prayer, and when it turned your turn to pray, you could say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, amen. And uh, I would teach you how to pray that. You say, that's not a good prayer. It's better than no prayer. And so and then I would start memorizing Bible verses, and you ought to memorize two a week, if at all possible. So I'd be at every church service, I'd always carry the Bible and the language. I would put the English Bible up when I went to church. I would uh, I would go to the church service. I would be at visitation with them. I would be at work day with them. I would do everything with them like I wanted to be a, one of them. Can I remind you, sometimes people act like uh, it takes a long time to get to be a missionary and sounds like you're asking for two more years. Jesus was God and he took 30 years. How about that? Jesus was God. He took 30 years to begin his public ministry, and he became so much like them that they thought he was one of them. And so you want to bear that in mind when you start thinking about going to the field. You have a lot to do to blend in and become one of them. Amen. Um, okay, I think this is from the woman's point of view. What if I'm doing everything just to take care of my kids, chasing them around at church, etc.? How can I still serve? Well, I think I think that uh, you you know I just think you've got to train your children a little bit better. I'm sorry, but a small child can be taught to sit down and be quiet and listen. Uh, you can teach them before they're one year old. You know, it's amazing. I was just in Burkina Faso, Africa, and we pulled up in the car to a village, and there's a hundred people sitting out there, and there are small children and uh, 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 three, four years old sitting down, and they sat there for one hour and did not move. Uh, the one lady who did move, there was a grown woman, she got up and ran and there was a panic and and because she saw a phantom, she saw a ghost, uh, whatever. But the truth is, uh, well, you need to train your children. And so I would suggest that now, uh, you should now start having your children sit down and uh, have family devotions and have them sit still for three or four minutes then five, then 10, then 15. You can let them draw or color. Uh, I would not let them play with an electronic device. I think that'll hinder your ministry in the long run, especially overseas, but you could let them, you could let them uh, draw pictures. You could let them uh, write on a sheet of paper, but your children can be taught to sit still. And unless your child has some kind of problem, your child can be taught to sit still. And you should quit making excuses about your lack of training of your child. The Spanish word for brat is a, an excellent word. It literally means bad raised. So when you talk about a child that is a brat, in Spanish you would say he's a bad raised child. 
So it's the parents' fault, <laughs> not the kids' fault. So I think you ought to help your child learn to sit still. I think you ought to help your child learn to pay attention. <laughs> okay, next question. What if I don't learn the Notice language? Notice how he left that one. <laughs> I had to drop the microphone, and he took off running because he doesn't want anybody hating him. They can always hate me. I'm the guy you can hate. You know, it, uh, raising our kids is, I mean, there's a lot of uh, crucial things about it, and we're preparing them, but not only are you preparing your own kids, and it's for your own sanity. There's a whole lot of parents who have nothing. They know nothing about the gospel. They know nothing about raising a Christian home. They know nothing about a family, and you're the example. And so you have to get things right in your own house. Let me let me say this to you: raising children is not letting them do what they want to do. The very first lesson your child ought to learn is the word no. They ought to learn to be told no, and they ought to learn they can't throw fits, and they ought to learn they got to sit still. And so you need you need to actively, intentionally, on purpose train your children. What is extremely sad to me is that you can train a dog or a cat, but you can't train your child. You can teach a dog to wait to go to the bathroom. You can teach a dog to sit when you tell them to sit. You can teach a dog, but you can't teach a child. And so here's the deal. They used to tell me on the farm, you have to be smarter than the animal if you want to train it. You have to be smarter than your child. So you need to say no. You need to say sit down and don't move. You need, look, don't just, don't chase your children. That's a bad precedent. You'll be chasing them when they're 20. Don't chase them. Teach them to sit down, sit still, put their hands in their lap, look forward, pay attention, teach them. What's really sad is if you can't raise them, just take them to the school system, and they can. Why can the school system get your children to do what you want? Because they discipline, and, and that's even a public school. That ought not be like that. Amen. Amen. Um, it was just some, some greetings. We have uh, Pablo Rojas de Bolivia. Um, Hola, hombre. Buenos dias, hermano. Um, Several others, Jonathan Anderson from uh, um, from Mexico, and several other friends are writing in. Uh, thank you, and we certainly appreciate your time coming on here. What if, uh, let me get a couple more here, Pastor. Um, what if I don't learn the language good enough to teach the Bible, in a, uh, at least for a long while? What can I still do to serve in that ministry? I think you should never even ask that question. I think you should start out saying, I will learn the language. I think when you set up to say, what if I don't, you've just set yourself up and you're giving yourself an out. Don't give yourself an out. Language learning is aptitude, not attitude. Is attitude, not aptitude. It is your desire, not your ability. I didn't have language ability. I was told that in high school. I was told that in college. And I was told that in Mexico when I went to language school. And I really don't have language ability. I don't hear well. And I, you can learn the language. Uh, uh, so you, what you do is you use what you got. You, you, if you got to use, uh, uh, crutches, you use crutches, but don't use English. And, and so, uh, maybe instead of one year, you need two years, maybe instead of two, you need three, but don't you dare leave that ministry until you learn the language. But I will tell you this, you should not have an attitude of, I can't, I don't expect to, I'm not sure God will let me do that. That shouldn't be your attitude. Amen. Your attitude should be, I fully expect that God will help me get this language. Get on your knees and beg God for the language and then put in the hours. You can learn the language if you put in the time. You will not learn the language if you sit around your house reading books about the language. It is social. Swimming is best learned wet. You must get out among people and be corrected. And it's going to be very hard on your pride, but that's how you'll learn. You know, Sunday morning, Pastor preached a message uh, here we're in the book of Mark, and he was talking about uh, from Mark nine twenty three, where he said, um, you know, he that believeth to him, you know, it's, it's possible to him that believeth. And then he went through and showed throughout the passage and a lot of things that are against us, even in our lives, in our ministry, in every area, when we just give up and say, you know, it's, it's impossible, it can't be done. Um, did God really send you to a country knowing that you can't learn a language? Did God really send you out on the road knowing you can't um, you know, raise the money or whatever. Maybe you and I need to have a little bit bigger faith and believe that God can teach us the language and raise our money and do these different things. It was a phenomenal message. The honest truth is many times it's our lack of faith and we can't please God 
without having that faith, you know, that God will be with us and he'll help us. And, you know, that verse actually said, or verses that we use said that he couldn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And why are you a faith missionary setting yourself up for doubt and fear? Doubt and fear has torment. Doubt causes fear. Trust God and get out of the boat. Amen. Amen. Let me uh, ask another question um, here in this, this area. In summary, after our first two years on the field under a veteran missionary during language school, uh, what should we have accomplished? The husband, what's his goals? What is he going to look back and say, this is what I accomplished? And the wife at the same time. The two years, right? Yes, sir. Well, we've, uh, we've done previous podcasts on what to accomplish in the first two years, and so I'd suggest that you go back and find those, and I don't know how to tell you. Maybe the guys that put the podcast up might give you a link to that. But the first thing is the language, and the second thing is to become cultural. Uh, it, it is an incarnational ministry. That means you take on their nationality, their way of thinking. It's the biblical explanation. It's what Jesus did. It's what the apostle Paul did. Paul said, I become all things to all men that by all means I might win some. And so you should spend that first two years, you should be uh, fluent in the language. You should understand the culture as much as possible, which means you spent 40, 50 hours a week outside the uh, house being around nationals and learning all about them. You should have memorized by then, oh, 100 to 200 Bible verses in their language. Uh, you should probably have read much of the Bible through, at least the New Testament in the language, unless you're like in Hindi or Chinese or, or Arabic, maybe some of these very hard languages. But even there, you ought to learn, you ought to read a certain amount of the Bible through. You should have led somebody to Christ. You should have already taught Sunday school. You should, uh, your wife should have already taught Sunday school, ladies meetings. In other words, you should be getting active ministry experience in those two years. You should be practicing with the weapons you have. So at the end of two years, you should be able to say, I got a good handle on this. I'm no expert, but I got a, I got a place to start. I know how to go about it. Because let me tell you, as soon as you're alone starting that new church by yourself, you're going to wish you to learn all you could. You're going to wish you to practice all you could. You know, um, sometimes the uh, the wrong thought could be, well, if I win somebody to the Lord, they're going to end up staying at that missionary's uh, ministry. Or if I disciple somebody, what if he wants to serve God? Now I have to leave him and I go start from zero. You know, that's never a waste. That's not a bad investment. The more you do is the more experience that you have that you can use when you get there. So they say that Gene Edwards says in his books that um, David was in there there in the wilderness and he kept throwing rocks at those trees and he kept splintering all these little trees so that when the lion and the bear came and when Goliath came, he was so practiced and experienced and ready that it was not even a big deal. And so you and I, as you know, when you're a missionary, when you're working under somebody, you practice as much as possible, win as many people to the Lord. You know, take through as many people as you can through discipleship. Do so much that you're building up your brother that when you get there, God gives you the same amount of blessings um, or even more because you're already doing the work. I so firmly agree with that. And I, I just think you want to to get involved. And, you know, you're we're not building your ministry. We're building, um, we're building the Lord's kingdom. We're not about us. We're about him. And if I help you build your church, it's okay because I'm here to serve God and to do as much of that as I possibly can. One dear brother in Russia, and thank you for uh, chiming in, dear brother. He said, Dr. Sisk always said, you can never lead the wrong person to the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is exactly right, brother Van Sant. I think that is, I agree 100%. And by the way, if I help another man's church grow, and a man, another man's ministry that I'm in, I'm building my brother's name. I'm making a difference. I find that to be one of the most exciting things I could possibly ever do. So I, I hope you won't be like that. Have you learned to eat the food? Well, you don't have to eat it at your house, but when you're with those people, have you learned to eat the food? Have you, have you learned how to greet people correctly? Have you learned how to act in a social setting? Have you learned how to act at church? Have you learned how preaching goes and teaching goes and time goes? Have you learned how to buy and sell? Have you learned how to live in the economy? Can you get from one place uh, to another place? Uh, can you ask questions and get answers? So there's a lot for you to be working on in those first two years. 
Amen. It's our goal through these podcasts and uh, through several different uh, things that we put out. Uh, we just want to be a help and an encouragement. Um, listen, dear friends, there's a lot of other brothers out there that are serving the Lord, and you and I have to do our best, not just to serve, but grab a hold of all the, the tools that we can so that we can be better servants of God. So I hope this will be a blessing. Uh, we'll be back at another moment uh, to make some more podcasts, and I hope you'll jump on here. You could always look on worldevangelism.net. You can look on um, missions.tips. You can look on several different web pages or just in iTunes for Leadership with Vision. You can find a uh, big list of all the different ones that we've covered in the past. And we'd love to have you uh, stay in touch with us. We'd like to be a blessing to you. Uh, we're excited about you. You don't have to be a vision missionary for us to be excited because if you're for him, we're for him and Amen. we're for you. And so we're excited about getting the word of God around the world. I'm excited about what God's doing all over the world. We serve a great God doing Amen. a great work. And uh, so I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk to you. I'd like to help ask you to please extend a, an invitation. We're going to have a pastor's conference to try to help pastors and uh, with missionaries and understanding missionaries. And so uh, you can go to ogpastors.com and learn a little bit more about that. We'd love to have you uh, as a missionary come with them, bring them. And we're just going to talk about church work with between pastors and uh, missionaries. And so I'd like to invite you to uh, share that with us, share with other people about it. And then right after that, on the heels of that, that'll be May 7th, 8th, and 9th, the Pastors' Conference. And then after that, we'll be having the um, OG Camp, our Generation Camp. And that'll be June 18th through the 22nd. My friend Trent Cornwell will be leading that up. And you can check that out, visionmissions.com slash events. Uh, you can find out a lot more uh, there. But we hope that uh, anything that we have to offer is definitely yours, and we certainly appreciate your time being with us today. Thank you for your very kind comment, Mother Pittman, and God bless each of you. Have a great day.